So, if we look specifically at the black hole warbler, which has a very broad breeding distribution across North America, we actually get over half of our black holes just at Matinic Island alone are coming from uh, Western Canada and Alaska. Now, that's interesting because in the 2006 uh, Alaska Fish and Game Report, they specifically pointed out that black hole populations have experienced one of the fastest rates of decline of all um, North American warblers. And many of the populations in Western Canada and Alaska have declined by as much as 90%. And so, could it be that these trends then are showing declines in populations that are coming from the west. In other words, we can't assume that what we're seeing at a particular banding station represents the breed, their, our nearest breeding population. Okay, um, I'm gonna continue talking a little bit more about banding and now start integrating it with another method like radar. So here we have Matinic Island, um, banding data from Matinic Island, and then Dave Mizrahi was contracted by me to do some work at Mount Hegan Island for the university's offshore wind project there. And so it's about seven miles and 11 kilometers apart. And what we've done then is plotted the daily banding totals at Matinic over this period of time from uh, late August to late September. This is a storm where we had to evacuate people. And um, this is just a two-day instant average plotted here. When we look, when we plot the radar data in terms of the um, sunset to sunrise, so the nocturnal component of the targets per hour recorded the, uh, for each of the nights preceding the days of banding, we actually have a significant correlation. So in other words, the density of birds over Monhegan correlated with the patterns of uh, numbers of birds banded the following morning at Matinic. And these areas are seven miles away. So. This is a good example of how you can integrate two uh, methodologies to infer something like uh, a broad front migration. In other words, patterns of movement across one area are, across, are occurring over a broad area. Then we can get to bioacoustics. And of course, um, Bill Evans is one of the more recent pioneers of this technique of listening to birds in the night sky. He has uh, designed uh, these very inexpensive systems, these are microphones that are pointed up to the night sky. Um, they're automated. Uh, we use two different ways of recording them with the Wildlife Acoustics Automated Recorder or these uh, industry, entertainment industry grade, very high quality you know, um, H4N zooms. And um, bottom line is that birds call at night. And there's still some issue about why they call. So they make specific, these are not the kinds of things you hear at night, or in the daytime. They're in a completely different frequency range. They're extremely short in duration. And they're only in the context of migratory flight. So you get something that has a very characteristic frequency range here happening over milliseconds. There's that one. That one. That one. And, that one. and so for many of our songbirds, they have species-specific flight calls. So you can record and go back and pull the recordings up on software like Raven, developed by Cornell, and get a spectrogram, an ID, identified to species, although there is a complex of birds that make very similar flight calls that we collapse into a particular flight call type. But this is what you just heard. And so this gives us a lot more information about movement over a particular area. So we've set up monitoring sites, acoustic monitoring sites, and many of these are coupled also with radar or with banding. Um, and we've been, over the last three years, we've analyzed data now from over a thousand nights, different sites along the coast of Maine. And here's some, uh, an example of the kind of information you can get from acoustics. So if you just follow these dates, so we'll start here, uh, the end of the last week of August and follow up through mid-October, what you'll see is in blue the proportion of the flight calls that were warblers, in rusty red are the sparrows, and green are the unknowns. And you get what you would expect to see, that seasonal transition from a warbler-dominated uh, cohort to a sparrow-dominated group of um, 
birds. So that's kind of nice to see. And you can compare then the distribution of these species groups across the sites. When we look at, when we compare these different sites, and we want to look at um, not necessarily the species that are flying over there, but in this case, the number of birds or the intensity of flight calls, the rate of flight calls that we get, what we have is this really distinct pattern. So if we take, if we look at going from north to south and compare eastern sites to more western sites, the pattern is that if you take, whoops, seems to have shifted off, but if the bottom line is for every site that goes that's south and west of another site, you have a greater number of flight calls being recorded on the same nights. What that means is that you have more birds coming, that are occurring and coming, um, being uh, arriving at or moving over as you go further south and west. Another piece of information you can get is if you look at within a particular night, so I'm going to show you several days in or nights in September. So that we're starting out here September 23rd. And in this case, it's the hours after sunset. So this is zero here is sunset. And this is the night period. And this is dawn. So this sort of tan colored portion is dawn. And this is the number of flight calls. In this case, my house at Hamden. This is on the coast, Petit Manan Point. 84 kilometers distant between the two. And these are the number, the raw number of flight calls uh, for this particular night. So as I said, if you're west of another site, you have more flight calls in general. So if we just look at the patterns as we go through this um, five day period in September, what we see is if you were to look at the peak period of the number of flight calls after sunset, you have pretty much the same phenomenon going on with the peak period of the nocturnal migratory flight calls at both sites occurs around three to four hours post-sunset. You also have a post-sunrise pulse. So on the coast, these could be birds that are descending as well as arriving from other areas. Um, and here in Hamden, the same thing, birds descending and arriving. But the bottom line is inland, coastal, 84 kilometers apart, on any given night, you've got the same pattern of things going on. If birds are moving, the timing of their moving um, is very, very similar. Again, then that gives you an idea that we've got birds anywhere <coughs> and everywhere in a broad front migration pattern. Another way to look at um, the patterns of flight calls, this is hypothetical data. Um, can you use these to characterize a flight, let's, a site? Let's say that you have your flight calls that are consistently occurring three or four hours after sunset. And it might suggest that this is a passage area, that birds have been somewhere else and they're just passing over your area. Um, and if you really wanted to, you could take the average flight speed of a warbler and try to back calculate and find where the departure <coughs> area might be from your monitoring site. Um, if your preponderance of migratory flight calls are occurring right after sunset, then that might suggest that it's a departure area. You might be working at a site where birds are concentrating and they're departing within that first hour of sunset um, from your area. And then finally, if you have a preponderance of uh, flight calls uh, at or near dawn, then this could be an important arrival area. So again, if you're trying to understand how the topography of your region is being used, this is a, a really good way to do that. And banding won't tell you this. Um, you can look at species diversity. And here I've just uh, grouped all our flight calls by sparrows and warblers. And here I've broken them down by the species, or I said similar species groups. And you can compare the diversity of birds flying over a particular region. This is a great boost to my yard list. Uh, I actually got a few species uh, that I hadn't uh, visually seen, and I didn't have to get out of bed to count <laughs> them. So how do banding and acoustics compare? Are they really comparable? Can you replace one with the other? And there are differences in the costs um, involved with running a banding station versus setting up an acoustic monitoring station. But here are eight pairs of nights. So these are the data for banding on the morning following the, the previous night for which we recorded acoustics. So if I just pulled them by a uh, major group of warbler, sparrow, and thrush in this case, you can see that they're significantly different for six of the eight comparisons, six of the eight uh, night-day comparisons. Only two of the eight 
did we get uh, no difference in the um, proportion of birds, those groups um, being monitored. So the bottom line is, and we've done, we've looked at this a lot of other nights, there's really a poor correlation, and you wouldn't expect a good correlation because you're sampling different events. Banding is sampling birds that landed, and um, acoustics are sampling birds that are not. Okay, the great thing about uh, acoustics is it's very good at detecting the passage of shy species, and for those of you have uh, banded a lot of Canada warblers, you've probably only done that, uh, done that primarily on the breeding grounds. Um, they're very, for some reason, they just don't get caught with respect to the numbers that they occur in our area. And the same with Big Mills thrush. And this is a, um, these are data that I've actually used and with the uh, application for offshore wind projects. Okay, so the bottom line though is if you want to know how an individual is actually using your habitat, where it's moving, where it's feeding, how long it's staying, uh, when it leaves, then you have to follow the individual. We know that working with a lot of land bird migrants, especially small ones, we don't have the luxury of using satellite telemetry. And so low tech working with Phil Taylor again at uh, Acadia has developed these nano tags, extremely light, and now to, down to less than 0.2 grams now. Um, and these are uh, VHF transmitters. They're good for about uh, 20 kilometer range, um, and they can last now up to six weeks. That's pretty good uh, trying to document movements of, of small birds. Um, I can go into a lot more detail about how this system works, but for a lot less money than if you went out and bought a commercially available receiver station, um, you can build your own, and this is where Phil comes into really being a wizard technology, but you can build your own little sensor gnome um, there, and I can show you that. I spent the summer building little computer systems to do, um, to be automated, uh, powered by solar panels, um, with, in this case, we've only put up one uh, antenna, but you can put up four or six and really get fine scale spatial resolution. Um, but this whole system right here costs uh, less than uh, probably $1,500 instead of paying $18,000 for what you might buy on the market. And uh, to give you an example, the kind of information you can get back in 2010, uh, we set up these uh, receiver stations here in Nova Scotia and along the coast of Maine. And just to give you an example, this red-eyed vireo number 51 was banded up here um, August 28th, and he left. Um, that area was detected out here at Bon Portage um, on the 31st. And then he decided he didn't really want to cross the Gulf of Maine yet. And he went north up to Tuscat and got detected <coughs> up at that receiver. Didn't seem to be ready to go much of anywhere. And he spent the next six days hanging around the southwest area of Nova Scotia. But on the night of September 7th, he disappeared off the radar, if you will, or I guess off the telemetry, and he ended up over here. And we don't know uh, whether he went across the, the Bay of Fundy or uh, around that way. But that's a lot of good spatial information and information about how long that area, that bird stayed in that area, at least after its initial capture. So this is one of the things that came directly out of Nerman. It's now this Atlantic Flyway Digital Tracking Network. And uh, what came out of the movement mania, mania this spring. So what we now have are uh, telemetry stations that are not only in Nova Scotia, but pretty much run uh, throughout the Gulf of Maine into, in fact, off, off the map here is Monomoy, south of Cape Cod. And we now have partners that are doing everything from um, Again, the passerine studies, uh, shorebird studies, we just got a grant to uh, tag semi palmated sandpipers and track their movements. We have now um, detailed tracking on all but two of our birds. Um, three of the birds have decided to remain with us for a little while longer. But feeding, if you're interested in understanding where your birds are feeding um, to get food for chicks, that's a big thing for US Fish and Wildlife and uh, sawwood owls, oyster catchers, and bats. And what's nice is that we all share the data. The data go into a central base and then they're all 
Um, so you might only be able to afford two towers, but you get access to 22 towers, which is pretty darn good. Um, I'm, as a physiologist, interested in body condition. So many of the birds, we take blood samples so we can get a lot of information about, as I said, how well they're doing, and their breeding condition, etc. And now tying that in with the telemetry work, we can interpret more what that bird's doing. And that's helping us then to really evaluate habitat selection and resource quality. Now, another thing that we're using is the development of my little drone, the, um, the gannet. And um, it's actually amphibious. It's shown here with its little terrestrial wheels. It has a nine mile range. You can pack it full of GPS uh, uh, transects. <coughs> so you can go out and do a transect and do some habitat mapping for me. Uh, we're also rigging it up to do telemetry uh, and detect our birds and tell us where they are. So uh, this is still um, in the experimental stage, but uh, we're, we have been approached to have a contract with the uh, State and Fish and Wildlife Service to do eagle and osprey nest surveys, but we're using it to hopefully uh, do further tracking of our birds offshore. So we're actually my goal is to film and track birds moving across the Gulf of Maine. So what have we learned? The idea here is that the Gulf of Maine is busy, it's complex, and it's important because of the species uh, assemblage that's, that we have. It's very busy in spring migration, and it's certainly busy in fall migration with populations coming much further west than we had thought for our land birds. Um, the, the, all of this has come through integrating uh, the different methods and has helped us fill these gaps about uh, the spatial and temporal patterns of bird movements, um, where some of the flyway and stopover locations are, individual behavior and habitat use. And I think also for us it's helped us track um, or detect shy species and especially species of concern. So that's really what I wanted to just give you a smattering. I actually pulled out 30 other slides that I had in here because there's just so much going on. But I think as you go through the goals of this workshop, the question that was raised is, is there one or a combination of techniques that will address the above goals? So I'm hoping that uh, our experience, which is still in its infancy, um, might be able to guide you um, along in that. And I can help provide information about the costs that are one time or repeated costs, um, which are the cheap versus expensive techniques, uh, what about the time in the field? Where do you want to invest your time? Where do you want to invest your money? Uh, your expertise, what's available, and who's interested? You can't drag somebody into this. Um, and I can talk about the psychology of the network and how it has uh, it's been interesting to watch. It has been extremely positive. And uh, getting people in the room who didn't know each other, who had their respective objectives to meet, and to see them come together. And now we've spawned over $4 million worth of research money in just the last uh, two years. And that's pretty impressive. And, we're, you know, and that money supports graduate students. And is, it's just the trickle down of all of that is pretty impressive.